Welcome to the Behavioral Sciences section of our Practice MCAT questions. In this video, we're going to be going through questions 36 to 40. So first, I'll show you guys a question so that you can pause the video and attempt them on your own. Here's question 36, 37, 38, 39, and 40. Now let's go through the questions together. In question 36, we're asked which of the following terms best relates to individuals who anonymously donate to charity. So we're talking about individuals that donate to charity. Key word here is that they are doing it anonymously. And if you look at the answer options, we have two main terms, motivation or habituation. Motivation is the reason that someone performs an action. What is it that kind of drills them to do it? What is their motivation? And that makes sense because we're talking about an action here donating to charity and then the key term is anonymous so we can talk about motivation what drove them to first donate to charity and then secondly do it anonymously but the other two answers option c and d they're talking about habituation this is a term which is talking about you getting accustomed to something or getting habituated to it so when you're habituated to a stimulus that's because you kept on receiving it and your brain decided that this is something that's not that important and then i can ignore it for example when you get ready in the morning, you take a shower, and then afterwards you put on clothes. When you first put them on, you can actually feel that, okay, I just put on a shirt on my body. But then after a while, you don't even feel that you're wearing that shirt anymore, even though you still are. Even though your body's still getting the stimulus that you are, your brain just decided that this is something I'm getting constantly, so it's just something I can ignore, and there are more novel stimuli that I can focus on. That's habituation, but it does not relate to this question. Habituation, getting accustomed to something doesn't really make sense and it's not relevant when we're talking about donating to charity. So we can remove options C and D and social habituation might be something socially that you get habituated to. Affective habituation, affective means emotional. So maybe you had an, an emotional response to something, but then as you got habituated to it, you no longer have that emotional response. Either way, C and D we can remove. And then the difference between A and B, intrinsic and extrinsic motivation. Intrinsic is something you have within you so it's not some external reward that you want for carrying out an action it's just within you maybe it matches with your philosophy maybe you want to believe that you're a giving person or you believe in the cause that you're donating to this is just something on your own that you believe and then therefore you donate to charity whereas an extrinsic motivation would be for some reward maybe you do an action like for example if you are if you have a job you might have that particular job and do it every single day because it's your passion that would be intrinsic motivation extrinsic would be you don't really like it you don't care for it but you just go for the reward which is money and then another extrinsic reward could be fame if you donated to charity but it was known who donated and how much they donated then you would have this clout among your peer group that look at me i donated this much to charity but since it's anonymously done you're not even getting that fame therefore it's not extrinsic motivation, but it's just all an internal motivation to donate to charity. And therefore, A is going to be our correct answer. In question 37, it says in a sociological study, it is noted that individuals who drive a particular type of car obtain a higher level of respect by their peers when compared with a different car. The value that these individuals place on the car is referred to as what? So a particular type of car gets a higher level of respect and then we're comparing it with a different car and specifically we're talking about the values placed on the car what is that referred to as and in these answer options make sure to think about it from the sociological definition not just what we use day to day option a is privilege and this is something that's kind of an unearned thing that people have as a result of the social class that they're born into it's kind of an entitlement and it would be a bit more subtle than what we're talking about here. Here, they actively did choose to go and buy a car and they chose a specific type of car for some reason. So it's not really an entitlement that they have. An entitlement would be something a bit more subtle. Like for example, if you're in a higher social class, you don't really have to think about safety or access to clean water, things like that. You don't even think about them and you take them for granted, but it's something you have. But that's not really relevant and not the correct answer for this question. So we can remove A. Option B, social class is the divisions that we have in society based on socioeconomic income or socioeconomic standing in society, but it's kind of related to what we're talking about. If you're in a higher social class, then you're able to buy a more luxury car, but 
it doesn't match up with the, what the question is asking. It's saying, what is the value that these individuals are placing on a car? The value is not called social class. So B is incorrect. Option C is status. This is an option that you might pick if you kind of think about the everyday use, like you have a car that represents your status. But when we're talking about sociology, status is the, the role or position someone occupies in a given setting. So for example, if we're in a school setting, your role might be that you are a student or your status, sorry, your status would be that you're a student. That status is then associated with a role which has responsibility. So if your role is a student, you are expected to behave in a certain way and carry out certain actions. Someone else in the same setting, their status might be that they're a teacher and then that is responsible with its own role. So it doesn't really answer the question. The value that they place on the car is its status? No, that doesn't really make sense. But prestige in this case does make sense. Prestige in sociology is the value that in society we give to certain objects or actions. And therefore, having a certain type of car that's more expensive compared to a different type of car is a value that we placed. We placed higher value on this more expensive car because it relates to things like being rich and being of a high social class and all the things that come with it and everything else it says about the person that owns the car. So prestige is the answer option that best matches with what the question is asking us. In question 38, it says participants in an experiment were assigned to either an action group where they listed ways w that they could perform well on an upcoming physical exercise or a neutral group where they listed things they did on an average day. After performing the exercise, participants evaluated it. The action group demonstrated a greater increase in preference for their chosen physical exercise than did the neutral group. What was studied in this experiment? So first of all, we have an action group. And what they did is they listed ways they could perform well on an upcoming physical exercise. And then we also have a neutral group. They just listed things they did on an average day. Then they evaluated the exercise that they did. Action group, they had greater increase in preference for that physical exercise compared to the neutral group. Now we're asked, what was studied? What are the factors that we are studying in this experiment? And so let's look at the, the terms that are popping up in the answers. Motivation is something that we are studying. So motivation is if you're carrying out an action, what drove you to carry out that action? So they are evaluating themselves. What motivated you to evaluate this exercise as something you preferred versus that you didn't prefer it. And so that would come from the group that they were placed in and the exercise that they did before that leads to some type of motivation. Like for example, we can infer that from the action group, they thought about them being athletic and that they were gonna perform well on this upcoming physical exercise. So then when they did it, they were motivated to kind of do what they said they would do. And they said that they would perform well on this upcoming exercise, so they're motivated to do well. The other one just said things that they do on an average day, maybe that included like their job and chores and whatever, and not really exercise. So they don't have this motivation to think, oh, I was just talking about exercise and how I'm athletic and how I will do well on an upcoming exercise, right? They weren't thinking about it. They're not really motivated to kind of do well in a physical setting. So they might not have even known that an exercise was coming and then they just perform averagely. So motivation is something that was tested. Next, we see social facilitation. That's not really something that was tested or studied in this experiment. Social facilitation is a change in your performance when there is or isn't a group present. So for example, an athlete on a team, they can perform at a certain level when they're practicing by themselves, but when they have their other team members and the coach present, then they might perform better. So they're facilitated because of the social environment. And that is because of things like they want to really show how great they are and they want to push themselves further and they want to you know, impress their teammates and their coach. So that is why social facilitation is a thing. It can also negatively impact your performance, but it's a presence of a group or an audience. But it's not something that we tested here because if we were studying it, we would carry out the experiment with a group present and without, and we did not do that. So social facilitation is not something that we tested. So we can rule out, honestly, option A, C, and D. 
And then for option B, which is our remaining correct option, cognitive dissonance reduction. Did we study that? Yes, we did. Because cognitive dissonance is when you have a belief and then some action occurs in real life or like some action occurs in your life that either goes against it or, or yeah, something that goes against it. You have a certain belief, an action comes, it goes against it. Your options at this point are to either reject or deny what just happened because it goes against your belief and this is something which is contradictory or you can change your belief. So if you believe that you are athletic and then you perform well on something, some exercise, then you don't have cognitive dissonance, everything is matching up. If you believe you're athletic and then you perform poorly, then you have to accept that you know, you're not athletic or the, the exercise that you just did, it was something was off. You're normally better, but something was off on this day. So you do something to not have cognitive dissonance. And so if people said that they're gonna perform well, they don't want cognitive dissonance, so they're gonna do everything that they can to perform well because they said they would. So that is reducing cognitive dissonance. That is why B is correct and cognitive dissonance and motivation are both things which were studied in this experiment. In question 39, it says Louis is in the eighth grade. His science class is beginning a new chemistry unit and he was instructed to read the chapter in his textbook before attending class. What type of learning does this describe? We're asked for the type of learning and what happened is someone was asked to read a chapter in, his, in their textbook. So options A and C, these guys, they're kind of related and then so are B and D. So let's talk about A and C first. Reception learning is when you learn things from some source, like you're taught it directly. It could be from a teacher, it could be from a textbook, and that does actually describe what's going on here. Louis is reading something from his textbook. It's not like he's experiencing something and then he learned from his experience. Whereas discovery learning is that. It's the belief that rather than just being told things and lectured at, you should go out and discover things for yourself, have your own experiences and learn things. So when you encounter something new, you know, you can rely on your past experiences to deal with it. But then when you come out of this new experience, you add that to your list of experiences. That is a method of learning. So that's how re reception and discovery learning are related. And in this case, as I said, reception learning is what's going on. It's not discovery learning. And then B and D are related, fluid and crystallized intelligence. Fluid is a bit more, as its name implies, it can be, it can change and be adaptable, whereas crystallized are set things that you know. So crystallized is more so facts that you already know. Fluid is being able to reason on the spot and answer questions or deal with situations and then use some abstract thinking. So for example, if you have to answer some trivia question, I would rely on crystallized intelligence, things you already kind of know and their facts, whereas fluid intelligence is more so solving a problem on the spot. But we're not talking about either of these. We're not talking about him relying on fluid or crystallized intelligence, and it's not discovery learning. It's the reception learning, and the key part is because he's getting information by reading it from a source, by getting it from the textbook. So A is the correct answer. In question 40, we're asked which of the following is not a common criticism held by modern psychologists regarding the validity of Freud's theory of personality. So Freud has a theory of personality. Modern psychologists, they have a few criticisms again against it. Which one is not a common criticism? So the rest are. One of these options is not. Option A is saying his theories lack empirical data and no, this is a common criticism. Freud kind of put this theory out there about personality, about the subconsciousness, and there wasn't any empirical data that he provided to back this up. And it's also kind of hard to even get empirical data on this type of theory. So yes, this is a common criticism. They lack empirical data. His theories are not consistent with other cultures. B, yeah, this is actually another common criticism. This theory is very focused on the Western cultural experience and that too of the culture that Freud belonged to in the West. So it didn't really function or it didn't really factor in other experiences from cultures around the world, different countries, different tribes, things like that. It was, it didn't account for those. It just said that humans are this way everywhere and it's because it's something that humans have. 
and then C is related to that. The theories don't account for the effects of an individual's environment. It's just saying that humans are like this. It doesn't really talk about how the environment can shape your personality. And once again, it focused on one culture and it didn't focus on different cultures around the world, which would also be hand in hand going with the environment in that world, part of the world. And then option D is the correct answer. The theories are biased against children. No, this is not a criticism that psychologists hold against Freud's theory of personality. His theories, they describe development and the different stages that people go through as they go through different, as they go through life and they have different age groups that they fall into. And children is one group and he describes development as you are a child and then you grow up. And there's a very heavy involvement of the things that you go through as a child in Freud's theories. However, nobody really says that it's biased against children or anything. It's just that it's kind of a key part of his theory. So option D is not a common criticism against Freud's theory of personality. Therefore, it's the correct answer for question 40. That's it for the questions in this video. If you enjoyed what you saw, make sure to check out our course. The link is in the description below. In that course, we go through a lot more questions just like this, breaking down the question, what it's asking for, and going through all the different answer options, explaining why each one is correct or incorrect. Other than that, make sure to subscribe here to this channel to stay up to date with the videos that we post here.